Now earlier we had seen mass spectrometry. To, uh, we used it to find the isotopes of different elements. And the apparatus is not never going to be a concern. But we can also use mass spectrometry in organic chemistry. Mass spectrometry can help us find a few things about organic molecules without them even reacting. In fact, this chapter is part of the branch of chemistry called analytical chemistry. So you analyze data to figure out the structure of molecules. Infrared spectroscopy, IR, is part of that. Later on, we'll do NMR, that's also part of that. But mass spectrometry helps us determine the structure or some parts of the structure of an organic molecule uh, using its mass data. One of the things you find out is using a mass spectrometer is you can use it to find the exact MR of a substance. Now, that means that if, it, if you have an unknown organic molecule, have nothing known about it, the, the spectrum, the mass spectrum can help us determine the MR of the actual organic molecule. All right, could be any unknown molecule. So this is basically how to find out st uh, stuff about an organic molecule without having it undergone any reactions. So we can know the MR of an unknown compound. We can also, by the way, know the, figure out the number of carbon atoms in an organic compound. And that number is key because that can tell us a lot about it. And obviously I'll tell you how to find the number of carbon atoms, but this is the use for it. Now collectively, one and two can help us a lot. Because if I know the MR of a substance and I know the number of carbon atoms of a substance, I can use that to find out even the molecular formula of the substance. So collectively, they can help us do that, find the molecular formula of substances. So uh, together, uh, for example, if you have no idea what a compound is, you know, it could be any number of carbon atoms. You can narrow it down to, let's say, a five carbon compound having a mass of 90 or something. That helps you know what other atoms might be involved in it. And the third use of a mass spectrometer in organic chemistry is that we can find out if the compound has either a chlorine or a bromine atom. Because a chlorine and a bromine atom, actually the element chlorine and bromine, have two different isotopes. Chlorine is 35 and 37. Chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. And bromine has bromine 79 and bromine 81. What that tells me is that if I have, if I have com a compound containing bromine or chlorine, then I can even figure out from the mass spectrum, does it have bromine or chlorine? Because I know these guys have isotopes. So we'll obviously talk about how that's used also. I'm just giving you an intro right now of the fact that this is another thing we can find out. And the fourth thing we can find out using a mass spectrum is that we can figure out, we can get idea of fragments of a molecule and we can piece together the fragments to figure out the structure of the organic molecule. So this is like using a jigsaw puzzle and putting the molecule back together. Now, this isn't the most accurate way. We have more accurate ways that we'll do later in NMR. But this is still somewhat accurate to help us piece together some form of structure of an organic molecule. Like things like, does it have a CH3 group? Does it have an acid group? Or all that stuff. And so we obviously we'll see all of this stuff. We'll be able to do all of these four. Ma uh, the MR, the number of carbon atoms, does it have chlorine and bromine, and we're gonna use fragments to figure out the structure of the organic molecule. So let me show you a mass spectrum. The graph of mass spectrometry uh, mass spectrometer apparatus gives us of an organic molecule. All right, so this is an organic molecule. We don't care what it is right now, but let's take a look at this particular spectrum. 
for any organic molecule, you're gonna get a spectrum like this. On the x-axis, you're gonna have mass number, but in most cases, it's not really a mass number. Theoretically speaking, it could also be called m over z, which is what many, many books do it as, the plus charge over the ma mass over the plus charge, or it can also be known as mass over electrons. And mass over electrons is again another way of saying mass over charge. Since we know that every particle that gets detected in the mass spectrum Ha is charged with a one plus charge. And all these lines are called peaks. There are three peaks that are marked as 15, 43, 58. Those are the mass numbers of those peaks or the mass over charge of those peaks. And then there are smaller peaks also. And those all peaks that you will study refer to fragments. There's abundance on the y-axis, we don't really care about that. But this is the whole mass spectrum. We're gonna be able to read this and get some information from this. You know, we'll talk about the MR. Now look at this value. Now I'm highlighting the peak at 58. That's 58 because the mass here is 58. Now that peak is the highest mass of the whole molecule. So you need to know that, that the highest mass peak will always be called the MR of the molecule. What that means is this mass spectrum is of a molecule whose MR is 58. That's what that means. It has smaller fragments at 15 and 43, but its MR is 58 because the largest value on the x-axis that has a peak, this is the peak, is, is that mass is called the MR. That's how we can determine. So when we see a spectrum, understand that the largest mass on the x-axis shown, that would be the MR of the whole organic molecule. Now, they're obviously 15 and 43 and 58, those are fragments, 15 and 43. But 58, this fellow is basically your MR. These smaller peaks are fragments. So these smaller peaks, even 15 and 43, even these small ones, these are all fragments of the large molecule. It's like the large molecule was chopped into small pieces and that's what you got. Now. This peak is also known as the molecular ion. Basically, it's actually technically speaking the molecular ion. The ion of the whole molecule is called the molecular ion and we give it a label. This peak is called the M peak, basically. This peak is called the M peak. And the M peak's mass is the MR, in fact. And everything else is smaller parts of the molecule. 15, and if you notice something, 15 and 43 add up to 58. And these smaller ones are really insignificant. But the 58 is the mass peak, and you can even say that the 14 and the 40, 43, 15, or the two pieces are made of 58. But the one thing we can say for sure is that, for now, is that the MR is 58. We'll talk about fragments later. Right now, I'm just talking about the molecular ion and knowing that the graph can help us determine the molecular ion. Now the abundances of any of these peaks are not our concern, especially the 15 and 43, nobody cares. In fact, not at this stage, and if you ever were to do this to this particular uh, area of analytical chemistry, obviously in much more detail in university, you'd get into why particular abundances occur, probability happening, other things like that. For you guys, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you don't know why 15 and 43 are high and low. We won't get into that right now, all right? Now, at many times, they'll give you more information than, like for example, they'll say, this is an oxygen-containing compound. Or they might say, this is the carbonyl compound. Now, having that information helps because a carbonyl compound has a CO double bond. So a CO double bond would add up to this mass of 58 and everything else along with it. So information will be needed to figure out what this molecule is, more information. So far, by just looking at it, I can say for sure that its MR is 58. And there are a few organic molecules whose MR is 58. You know, but uh, I think butane is 58. Propanone is 58. Propanal is 58. So a little more information would become a long way. Even methylpropane, if butane is 58, so is methylpropane 58. So all of that information would have to be given to us, more, more information, for us to figure out the molecular formula, the structure of this. Now mass spec really helps us to find the molecular formula. We won't worry too much about the structure. 
mainly the molecular formula, which will come from the MR and the number of carbon atoms. Okay, so let's play around with this more. So if I were to give you a little more information, maybe we could figure some more things out. You can even figure out the molecular formula for this. So let's say I tell you something about this. Uh, I'll make this up, by the way. So 15 and 43, are, these are fragments. They help us determine the structure of the molecule if you wanted to, all right? But the mass is 58, I'm gonna use that. So let's say I tell you that this is an oxygen containing compound, okay? Uh, when I do that, I know therefore the molecule must have something like this. It must be CxAhyOz. And uh, now we don't even know how many oxygens does it have so far, right? So if somebody says, okay, if I tell you that in the question, okay, this molecule contains one atom of oxygen. Now that information is gonna be very important to determine everything else. So if they tell you that, hey, there is this molecule that has one atom of oxygen. I want you to figure out what the molecular formula is given the mass is 58. So the mass is 58, can you figure out the molecular formula? Now obviously 58 is made up of X carbons, Y hydrogens and one oxygen. So the way to find out is to remove oxygen from 58 and that remaining mass is taken up by carbons and hydrogens. And then you'll be able to figure out how many carbons it has. That's deductive reasoning. Now, if I take out 58 to 16, I've got 42 left for both of these guys. Now 42 can take up how many carbon atoms? So how many can I make, how many carbon atoms can this contain and still be within 42? I would they need three carbon atoms because three carbon atoms will have a mass of 36. So 42 can only contain a maximum of three carbon atoms. So if you've got one oxygen, it must have three carbon atoms. So if it's three carbon atoms, that leaves me with six hydrogens because 42 minus 36 is six or 36 plus six plus 16 gives me 58. Now, knowing the mass spectrum 58 and the, the idea that the compound is CxHyO, we can determine the molecular formula. And that's big because molecular formula is important enough for us to understand. So now that I don't know the molecular formula, I can piece together the molecule by looking at the fragment or even the reactions, by the way. Now, why did I assume the maximum number of carbon atoms? You need to understand that there is a maximum number of hydrogen atoms the molecule can have. And the maximum number of hydrogen atoms the molecule can have are 2n plus 2. So if I had assumed that there were only two carbon atoms here, that would leave me with 24 mass of carbon and 42 minus 24 would be, like 42 minus 24 would give me 18. I can't have C2H18O. So it's knowing that hydrogen is only mass of one and I cannot have more than six hydrogens for two carbon atoms. It can't be two carbons, it have to be three carbons. And hydrogen can only be a maximum of, with three carbons, there can only be a maximum of eight. And this is less than eight, that's fine then. All right? Now understand, we were given the graph, which has an MP of 58, which is the MR, and just this information, that's a compound containing one oxygen atom. So using that and the mass, we figure out it must be C3H6O. Now we can also look at the formula and look at the fragments to, f to try to figure out some structure, all right? Now these fragments for C3H6O are 15 and 43. They are the major ones, right? And you know, this is the formula of the molecule, 58. So which combination of atoms from C3H6O can give you 15? That's what you gotta think about. You gotta think about which combination of atoms. I want the molecular formula of the fragment that gives a mass of 15, knowing these are the only elements I have. It can't be oxygen, it have to be one carbon, and therefore the remaining must be hydrogen. So this fellow must be because of a CH3 in the molecule which is quite common, yeah? And therefore, you can also figure out then what 43 is. If CH3 is 15 and the whole molecule is 58, 58 minus 15 is 43. So literally, if you remove CH3 from C3H6, you'll get 43. So literally what you wanna do is, if you wanna know the molecular formula of what made 43, just remove the, the CH3 from the molecule. 
So the molecule is C3H6O. To get 43, just remove CH3 from C3H6O. And what would you get? C2H3O, right? C2H3O. That's what you would get for 63. So now 43. So now you, and that's what they'll ask you. They'll say, okay, you know what? Figure out the formula that made C2H3, I mean 43. That's C2H3O. And the other one is CH3. And if you're wondering, what could C2H3O be? It could be a CH3CO for that matter, right? CH3CO, that's one option. So you figure that part out. I mean, obviously this, by looking at the molecular formula, this looks like a ketone or an aldehyde, really. You know, it's so easy to figure that out. So if you know that sad, you can also break down the molecule and figure out how to make up 43. The other way is looking at the formula, minusing this. So one option is CH3, CH2, CHO, because this is C2H3O. The other could be CH3, CO, CH3, you know. Knowledge of organic functional groups will help you here. Yeah. The other could be CH3. COCH3 and COCH3 is a mass of 43. That's C2H3O. All right. That's not the only two structures. You could come up with some other structure also. You could have a double bond within OH also. Absolutely. So there are multiple other structures that could be. You'll have to have more information, right? But if you were to ask to draw a possible structure, you could draw any of these three. Now, this is another possible structure of this compound is a double bond and an alcohol. And the alcohol can be on this CH3 also. So wherever the position, because you cannot tell which isomers exist because of mass spec. It's very difficult. So you can give up proposed possible structures. And that's all that you're gonna use this for. Other analytical chemistry is more accurate. But this, this is more than enough for this. So, you know, both, all three have the CH3 group and all three can have a fragment that is C2H3O. So any of these three could have been possibilities unless they give you more something else. Like, hey, it formed a, a brick red PPT with fellings. Now you know which one is it. This one. If it said it gave me a hydrogen gas with sodium metal, then you know it's this one, basically. Yeah? So they'll give you more information like that. If they'll say it formed a diol with cold dilute KMnO4, or it decolorized cold dilute KMnO4, then you know it has an alkene. But so they can tie this up with a lot of organic chemistry together. So that's why. Now, the next thing we're gonna take a look at is the same graph. I'm gonna show you the same graph or the same molecule, but I'm gonna focus on and zoom in towards this part of the graph, the MR part of the graph because there is something else happening here in the MR or the, ma and the, or the M peak of the graph. Remember the M peak was what? The molecular ion. And the idea was that this is the f mass of the full formal molecule of the compound, the, the whole molecule. Now, what you will see in most MR spec mass spec spec uh, spectrums, mass specs, is that there's gonna be a very small peak right up uh, ahead of the M peak almost insignificant peak that exists for one mass more than the M peak. So if the M peak was 58, this is 59. And it's called, it's referred to as the M plus one peak because it is one more mass than the M peak. And this peak is very, very important because the M peak is when all three carbons are carbon 12 for this particular formula. And the M plus one peak is for those molecules where one of those three carbons is carbon 13. Because carbon 13 has some abundance. And obviously you could have had two and three carbon 13s, but their probability becomes so small, they will exist here, but they would be non-existent. Their heights would be non-existent. Because the probability of this happening is already one over 100. So if you want three carbon 13s, it would be one over 100 into one over 100 into one over 100 extremely small. So I'm only concerned with where one of the three carbons is carbon 13. And why am I focusing on this? Because it's gonna, we're gonna be able to use this particular M and M plus one peak and their abundance 
to actually figure out, calculate the number of carbon atoms in a molecule. Using the abundances of the M and M plus one peak, I can figure out the number of carbon atoms. Obviously, the re the, the it comes from um, the binomial expansion or binomial distribution of probability. But assuming knowledge of A-level math is not part of this, so we'll be just given we'll give you a very simple way to find out. This is a very very simple way to find out the number of carbon atoms in an organic molecule if they give us the abundance of the M peak and the M plus one peak. Remember, the M plus one peak will just be one more mass than that. So if I know the abundances of the M peak and the M plus one peak, I can find that out. Now how? Because it's a very simple ratio. For any organic molecule, the ratio of the M is to M plus one peaks. It's abundance ratio, the height ratio. The mass is one more. So the mass of this is one more. But the abundance ratio is for every 100 M atoms, uh, molecules, 1.1 N exist for M plus 1. Or, simply speaking, the abundance ratio of M to M plus 1 would be 100 is to 1.1 N, where N is the number of carbon atoms. What that means for this molecule is that the ratio of the two peaks here would have been 100 is to 3.3 for this particular molecule because it has three carbon atoms and in fact we are going to use this to figure out the number of carbon atoms for any molecule obviously for us to for us to use this we'll have to be given the abundances for both the m and the m plus one peak and we reverse engineer the number of carbon atoms because we know that the ratio of the m to m plus one peak is 100 is to 1.1 n that's all we do. And I'll show you how it's done. It's pretty simple. Let me show you. Let me put up a question and let's solve that using this method. So here is a question, you know, an example, is that the molecular ion peak of a compound has a mass over charge value of 136. Now what's the molecular ion? The M peak has a value, mass over charge value of 136. So therefore, what is 136? The MR of the molecule. And has an abundance of 17%. So the M peak has an abundance of 17%. On the other hand, the M plus one peak has one more mass than 136, which is 137. So the M to M plus one peak, I don't care about their masses, I care about their abundances. And the abundances is that the M peak is 17% and the M plus one peak is 1.5%. But they are supposed to be in what ratio? They are supposed to be in 100 is to 1.1 N. And how do I solve for N? I literally cross multiply and equate. So basically what I'm saying is 100 into 1.5 would equal to 17 into 1.1 N. And literally you solve for N. And you round off N to the nearest whole number. In this particular case, what does n come out to be? Now, using your calculators, it comes out to 8.02, which approximates to 8. Because n has to be a whole number. Therefore, this molecule has how many number of carbon atoms? 8. And it has what? So that's, that's uh, already I know so much. And it's got eight carbon atoms, and its mass is 136. And I didn't have to do a single reaction. So its MR is 136, and it has eight carbon atoms. That's a lot of information. Because I can now find out other things in the molecule. So there are eight carbons. Let's say I tell you that there's got something else in it, you know? Uh, because that would be what later on they'll probably add in the question. Now, where did we get this uh, 100 to 1.1 and if you're wondering? Basically, the probability of finding a carbon-13 isotope is 1.1% or 1 1.1 over 100. And this formula is gotten from binomial distribution of NCR, P to the power N versus Q to the power, uh, R to the power, uh, Q to the power N minus R. For those who don't take A-level math, you can ignore the math. You can ignore that, just use this formula. And for every 100 carbon, 12 atoms, 
we have 1.1 carbon 13 atoms basically so this ratio can be applied to any question where you're given m and m plus one peak and you'll get the number of carbon atoms now so far we've solved this question but what if i tell you that wait look at this formula and i'm telling you that it has another element to it and i'll tell you that yes we figured out it has eight carbons we don't know how many hydrogens it has but using i mean i tell you that it has oxygen also in it and now if i tell you it has two oxygen atoms then you can figure out the formula because eight carbons makes the mass eight times 12 for carbon and oxygen is two times 16 and the, that's 32 plus uh, 12 times 8, whatever that is, will help you determine the total remaining number of hydrogen atoms, basically. And yes, so it'll be 136 minus 12 times 8 minus 16 times 2. Okay? We'll leave you with the number of hydrogen atoms. I believe they come out to 8. So C8, the formula of this compound is C8H8O2. If they had told you that, hey, we got two oxygens also, obviously that information would have been told to you. If they didn't tell you to do, do they, if they didn't tell you the oxygen atom information, you would have been stuck at this simply this part that the compound has a mass of 136 and has eight carbon atoms. It, that itself is useful, but I'm just building up a question on my own here, by the way. All right, so let me give you another question. Let's try this one out. Let's check this one out. This is compound containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. They're telling you beforehand. It has a mass spectrum peak at what? 132, abundance of 43. So the MR is 132. That's the first thing I found out. Then the M peak abundance is 43.9% and the M plus one's peak abundance is 2.9%. But it's supposed to be what? 100 is to 1.1 N. And I just cross multiply and solve for N. That will give me the number of carbon atoms in this molecule. The number comes out to as a whole number rounded off is six, which means this compound is six carbons. We don't know how many hydrogens. We don't know how many oxygens, but we can still find that out because we have the MR. Because we know there are six carbons, right? So how much mass do six carbons have? You remove their mass from 132. Because that remaining mass will be the mass of collectively of hydrogen and oxygen. That's 60. Remember, the maximum hydrogen that can have is 14. So how many oxygens do you need? You need the maximum number. So how many oxygens can I fit in 460? I can fit three oxygens. Now three oxygens have a mass of how much? 48. So I've got, if I remove 48 from 60, I got 12 left which tells me that this formula must be C6H12O3. And the simple reason is that 72 was the mass of carbon and out of 60, how, what's the maximum oxygen I can have in 60? I can have three. I can't have four because you know four was gonna be 64. So I can only have three and three oxygens have a mass of 48, which would imply that I'm having three hydro oxygens and the remaining mass of 12 is because of all the hydrogens. And since hydrogen have a mass of one, a mass of 12 must be from 12 hydrogens. So this particular compound's formula must be C6H12O3. All right? And that's all you can really find out from this information. So let's move on, by the way, from this, yeah? Let's look at the last thing left for mass spec. Now the last thing left for mass spec is that we can also figure out if the compound has bromine and chlorine because we are going to use the idea of an m plus 2 peak we've already seen an m peak which is the molecular ion with the lowest isotopes carbon 12s we've seen the m plus 1 peak which is because of carbon 13. now we want to see the m plus 2 peak because chlorine and bromine both have isotopes whose masses are 35 and 37 or 79 and 81 meaning if you notice their masses differ by two units and what we realize is that if a compound has chlorine or bromine, then the M peak tends to have its lowest mass, 35 for chlorine. And the M plus two peak is because 
of two more mass units and if a compound had bromine then the lower mass with the lowest masses would be the m peak like like for example a compound like ch3br would have all the lowest isotopes and br81 would be the bromine isotopes with two more mass units and the lower masses are called the m peak and the greater masses are called the m plus 2 m peak m plus 2 peak m plus 2 again here the m peak is because of all the atoms isotopes being the lowest mass m plus 1 is when only one of them is carbon 13 and m plus 2 is when all of the carbons are 12 but chlorine or bromine is the higher isotope mass and obviously you can also have m plus 3 which would be chlorine 37 and one carbon 13 but we don't study that because i mean it's there but it's got no use for us we don't really care about that that exists even here this particular isotope if i have one bromine in an organic molecule the lower ice mass isotope will result in the m peak and the higher isotope mass will result in the m plus 2 peak and the reason why these two because they're both isotopes have a significant abundance they're not lopsided so if you have a CH3X, for example, if you have a CH3X, meaning a CH3Cl, then a CH3Cl will have certain masses. For example, the CH3Cl with carbon 12, hydrogen 1, and chlorine 35 would be 12 plus 3, 15, plus 35 is 50. That peak, those lowest isotopes, would be called the M peak. The M plus 1 would be the lower isotope of chlorine which is 35 but carbon 13 and that would tell us the number of carbon atoms the m plus 2 peak would be just two more masses than the m peak and that would be because of one carbon 12 and chlorine 37 if that applied to bromine and if the molecule was bromomethane then the m peak of the molecule would be 12 plus 315 mass plus 79 you know that's like what 79 plus 15 is 80 plus 4, 94 and then 81 would give you the mass of the molecule as you know uh, 96 so basically on the mass spectrum you would literally see peaks at m and m plus 2 for both chlorine and bromine and how we did distinguish between the two of them that's what I'm going to show you right now, how to distinguish between the two of them. Obviously, M plus 2 only exists when your molecule has one chlorine or one bromine. And if you have more chlorines and more bromines, you're going to have M plus 4s and M plus 6s. We're never going to study that. Uh, 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 we're only going to talk about the M and M plus 2 peak, basically. So, for example, what do we know about their abundances? That's the key here, because both chlorine and bromine are going to give us M and M plus 2 peaks. So if I look at a graph and I get an M and M plus 2 peak, how do I know it's chlorine or bromine? Well, we'll know it by their abundances. Because if it was chlorine, the heights would be in the ratio of 3 to 1. Because that's the isotopic ratio of abundance. But if it's bromine, the heights would be almost equal or 1 is to 1 ratio. Because bromine's two isotopes have an almost equal abundance. So literally, you know, if I have a CH3Cl, then there, there will be a mass of 50 and 52, and the abundance would be in the ratio of 3 is to 1. And if it was the same thing for bromine, there will be two masses, uh, 94 and 96, but their abundances in heights will be equal, almost, almost equal there would be a ratio of 1 is to 1. It's not exactly 1 is to 1, but it's close enough. So we call it approximately 1 is to 1. You'll see that, I'll show you graphs. And you can see that by looking at a graph, hey, uh, this has an M and M plus 2 peak, and hey, it's a ratio of 3 is to 1, therefore that's chlorine. If they're equal, hey, that's bromine, basically. Yeah? So let me show you a graph of such a molecule. So this molecule will have either bromine or chlorine, and we'll be, able to de we'll be able to determine which one, basically. Yeah, let me scroll down. 
So let's take a look at this graph. This is the mass spectrum of a particular molecule. Now you'll notice something here. It's got fragments. Yes, we get that. That's 43. They're fragments. But this group right here, that's your M, um, M peaks. Now, the M, I can zoom in, by the way. Let me look at zoom in. So it's pixelates, but we care. Who cares, right? We don't care. I care, but yeah, anyways. So they look at this peak and look at this small and look at the next one and the small one. What you can tell is that there's definitely an M peak. That's the large one. And then right next to it, this is the M peak. And that's the M plus two peak because it's two units more. And this small little tiny one is the M plus one peak. And this one, by the way, would be the M plus three peak. But who cares about that? The abundances of the M and the M plus one peak will tell us the number of carbon atoms. But the abundances of the two M and M plus two peak, they're equal. Because they're equal, we know this molecule has one bromine atom because they're equal. And if there were a ratio of three is to one in heights, then we'd say, hey, this molecule has one, uh, what? Chlorine. Yeah. And you can even figure out if this is bromine and it's near 120 and bromine is 79, I can know, I can also piece together the whole molecule remainder. But I have to be given the exact mass. And this graph is not too accurate, but they'll tell you the masses. So the question will include all of this kind of data. And we're going to be able to find the molecular formulas of compounds. Mainly that's what the mass spec will be for. To find the number of carbon atoms, the molecular formula of the compound, and if it has bromine or chlorine, that kind of stuff. All right. And that wraps up the whole idea and the knowledge needed for mass spectrometry as applied to organic chemistry.